great to have Simon with us again. It's good to see so many of you reconnect. Um, I will now hand over to Jemima to talk us through the group photograph. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to try and uh, look at the camera rather than looking at you all. I hear eye contact is important. Um, this morning, we're going to try and take a conference photo. Uh, so I hope you're all looking at your best, wearing your best outfits. Um, last year, one of the best photos that we had was of everyone uh, posing outside and waving. So this year, we're going to try and do that again, but it's going to be slightly different because we're going to do it over Zoom. Um, so the idea is going to be that we're all going to pose and look lovely and hold it for as long as we can without feeling awkward. And if you want to wave, that would be really nice. And then Richard is going to do the screenshots for us. So he's going to take a screenshot, go to the next page, take a screenshot. So I'm hoping that we can all hold a very friendly smile for about 10 seconds. If we can do that, that would be great. Um, and just to say in the chat, I've shared uh, the link to YouTube for yesterday's recording. So if you want to share that with other people and listen to Simon's talk again, please do. Uh, so Richard, if you're ready. I am. Okay, everybody get ready, smiling and waving from now. <laughs> this is great. There will be a prize for the best wave. So yeah, this is beautiful. <laughs> this is the friendliest Zoom chat I've ever been on. This is wonderful. Thank you so much. Got you all. The social media is going to go mad for it. Are we good? You yeah, are good. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. That's beautiful. Thank you. A number of years ago, we recruited a chaplain to go to Puerto Charente, um, and he went there, spent. A number of years there and we got to know him and his family really well and it was a joy to be with them uh, and then they up sticks and took the brave move to go and minister in Madagascar so it, I thought as a number of you know Adam Bolter and as a number of you pray for him that we take this opportunity to catch up with where things are for Adam and uh, you know, it's amazing, Adam, but there you are in Madagascar. Welcome. It's, it's all a bit surreal, isn't it? <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. So one year on, Adam, how are things? They're good. I mean, it's interesting. I, one of the dangers of being a missionary is that you, you turn up and you, you're a bit of a loose end for six months a year while you work the place out. And it's not been like that at all. I mean, we turned up and I pretty much hit the ground running and have been writing courses and delivering courses pretty much um, non-stop until we got shut down a few weeks ago because of our COVID fears. Um, so it's been great. Um, teaching under a tree. Um, the kids are enjoying school. They've got, there's a great French school here. Um, we've got a nice house with a nice garden. So yeah, no, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, we're we're what, thoroughly enjoying it. And what actually are you doing, Adam? What, what's your role? I, I'm running the Bible College, so um, that sounds very grand, but it's, um, it's nine students um, and uh, resourced by the people who so happen to be in the diocese, which isn't very big um, in terms of numbers of clergy. So I, I land up doing a lot of the teaching myself, um, which is fun, having to write kind of real beginners courses um, on, on everything from biblical studies to ethics, um, and then deliver them through a translator. So they they have to be in quite straightforward English. Um, so yeah, no, it's been, it's been great fun. And just to give a sense of the isolation, should you choose, and it, it not be a, a COVID-19 time, but in normal times, if you wanted to get, to come and see me in Coventry, how long would it take you? I, it depends. Um, if you can book it in an advance, um, then you can fly back, uh, probably manage the whole thing in two and a half days. The, uh, in the autumn, we had to get back in an emergency and it took us six days. We, we had to drive. Uh, it, it's about four days of driving and then it was two days of flights. So, um, so we're, and, and we're not the most isolated. If you, you can drive two, three days south of here on dirt tracks um, and be properly in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> we actually have shops and, and a clinic. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> 
And Adam, how are the family? Tell us about the family. Please. They're well. They're very well indeed. Um, I say the school turns out to be great. Um, I think it's the best school they've been in so far. We, it, it's, it's just a small international French school, but the principal turns out to be fabulous. Um, so yeah, they're, they're well. Um, they're, they're enjoying... It, it's just a very interesting country. There's lots of wildlife. There's lots of very strange geological formations. Um, it's very... Here comes one now. Here you go. You've got to say hello, Benjamin. There you go. <laughs> Um, so yeah, uh, the the main problem really is it gets very very hot and very very sticky in the summer, and that's tricky with erratic electricity. Um, so come, come say hello, Hannah. Hello. Okay, that's Hannah. Hello. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so so yeah, we're 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 thoroughly enjoying it. Um, the other major problem is being tropical; diseases just um, spread like wildfire. Mm. So um, any kind of infection, you, you have to just treat very, very quickly. So everyone has gone through at least one course of antibiotics since we got here. Um, you, you, you can't leave infections. They, they just don't go away. <laughs> and we really should ask, but how's, how's the COVID-19 affecting you there? Uh, it's pretty much non-existent here. So um, we're in the strange position where we, we have 70 cases up in the capital, which is four days drive away. They've sealed the island off. Um, they've stopped um, all air transport inside the island. Um, so COVID's not a big deal. Um, fear of COVID's quite a big deal. That's having some big impacts. Um, so the college is shut down. The students have been sent home. Um, and what we're really worried about is secondary impacts. So the food programs have stopped. The vaccination programs have stopped. Most uh, international agencies have pulled out. Um, and so we're really worried that we're going to get famine in six months time, that we're going to get a major outbreak of plague or um, measles or some other treatable disease in, in three months, six months time. Um, that, that's the real anxiety at the moment, um, because we, all the agencies have just taken their eye off the long term treatable diseases. Um, last year, measles down here killed about 6000 children. Um, uh, we, we have periodic outbreaks of plague. Um, these are totally treatable diseases. But if the medicines aren't here, they don't get treated. Yeah. So, Adam, following your journey as your friend, it's been inspiring to see someone that's followed where Jesus calls, whatever the consequences. And it's been a real joy and fun. Yeah, we catch up on Skype regularly. But um, a number of people I know have also been interested in your journey. How can we be praying for you? Um, I think that the main thing always is discernment and courage, isn't it? I mean, if, if we can discern what we're called to do and then pluck up the courage to do it, um, then, then we can be incredibly effective. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's prayers for discernment and courage uh, and prayers for the church here in Madagascar. This is a young church. The church in the south has only been going 10, 15 years. Um, the Ancans have been in Madagascar for a few hundred. Um, but this is first generation out of animism. Um, and it's, it's a delicate new shoot of a church. Um, and they're quite worried that the West has forgotten them. Um, you know, and, and I think ongoing prayers for the church here are really powerful. Um, this is a fast expanding church, but it, it feels forgotten. Um, and the Malagasy's down here in the South feel forgotten by, by most of the rest of Madagascar, let alone by the rest of the world. So, yeah. Okay. Ben, um, Adam, let me pray for you. Lord God, on behalf of the ICS family, I hold before you, Adam. Pray for his family, for Beth, for the children. Pray the blessing of God on them, Lord. May they know your protection, your guidance, your resourcing for the ministry as they're fulfilling. And in the day-to-day -day life, as they in interact with people around in the community, may they be something of the grace of Christ to people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Adam. Thank Great. you. Well, thank you. Indeed. God bless you all. <laughs> Marvellous. Thank you, Ben. Uh, allow me just to pray for Simon as he brings the word of God to us. Lord God, for what you've said through Simon already to us, we give you thanks. Take the words he's prepared, the thoughts he has, the inspiration of your spirit, that he may be your spokesperson to us today. 
In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Simon. Amen. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Well, I'm thrilled to be here, and uh, I'm so grateful for the invitation. And um, this morning, I want us to think about the love of God. Uh, everything around us is shaking, there's change, there's fear, there's uncertainty. But the one thing that stands sure and certain is God, who is love, and his love for us. So that's where I want us to go this morning. If you've got a Bible, please turn to John chapter 17. And you'll know this is the so-called high priestly prayer. And the Lord is about to be arrested and the amazing thing is that he's not just thinking of himself, but he's thinking of us. The whole of Easter is about his thoughts for us and actions for us. And here he's praying for us. And I want to read from verse 20 to the end of chapter 17. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one, Father, just as you and me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you've sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and that you have loved them, even as you love me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am, and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them, and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. We all understand that there are different levels of love. We've all read it, we've all taught it, we know it. I love the Lake District, but I love the Swiss Alps more. I love roast beef, but I love curry more. I eat it about two or three times a week. I love being at work with my colleagues, but I love being home with Tiffany a lot more. In the ancient world, as you know, Greek was the lingua franca. And much as English is today, Greek was a nuanced language that was used across the civilized world. And it had a variety of words to describe love. There was eros, erotic love, philia, love for a friend, storge, parental love. And then there was this agape love. It was an elusive love. It was a word that already existed, but it was little used. And when the church came into being in the first century, she searched this language to find a word that would convey this remarkable, extravagant, expansive love of God. And they chose this little word, agape. Now the etymology of this word is uncertain. The prefix aga, a bit like the word mega, uh, is an intensifier or a supercharger. And pao means to protect. So it's likely that it comes originally from a word meaning to fully protect. But it came to be the choice word that was infused with the Christian understanding of God's love revealed to us in Christ. And this is the word that St. John and the early church place on Jesus's lips to describe God's love. Uh, it probably corresponds to the Hebrew word that we know, chesed, uh, which means love you cannot break, love you won't go back on, a covenant-keeping love. C.S. Lewis, in his book on love, described agape as, quote, the highest level of love known to humanity, a selfless love 
passionately committed to the well-being of others. And here we are at the Last Supper, and this is Jesus' last supplication. And he's preparing for his betrayal and his arrest, his trials, his beatings, and his cruel murder. And yet he's praying for his disciples, and not just those who are there with him, as it says in verse 20, he's praying for all who would believe. And this is the extraordinary thing here, that Jesus then and there was praying for you and me right here and now. And he prays for several things. He prays for our protection from the evil one. He prays that we'd be made clean. He prays that we'll see his glory. And he prays especially for unity. But one of the most profound things in this beautiful prayer, we see here in verse 23 and verse 26. Jesus says that the Father loved him from before creation. And then he says in verse 23, he prays that the world may know that the Father loves the disciples just as the Father loves him. And then in verse 26, he repeats this theme that the love father with which the father has loved me, Jesus, may be in them. So Jesus underlines this theme twice, and we must pay attention because it is precious. The father loves you and me in the same way that he loves eternally his son, Jesus that the same love with which the Father loves the Son will be in them. And Jesus wanted them, and Jesus wants us to know that Father's love. God loves us with this agape love, this superlative and definitive and exhaustive love. And he couldn't love us any more if he tried. He's perfect. All his predicates are perfect. All his actions are perfect. And if he loves us, as Jesus says he does, then he loves us perfectly. God loves us the same as he loves his eternal son, Jesus. I want us to think just briefly about some aspects of this love. Firstly, God's love is not abstract. It's not a theory. It's not conceptual or philosophical. It's not just words. We can't describe human love, but those who felt it know it's real and how it feels. And Jesus prays that God's love will be in us. Verse 26, you see that? That the Father's love would be in us. And then he, and he prays in verse 23 that this love will be seen in us. And I want to suggest that this love of the Father is both an experience and it is something that we evidence. In other words, it's something that we feel in us and that others see in us. Verse 26 and verse 23. This love is unmistakable. It's a felt love and it's an observable love. And it's a love that is poured into us by God's Spirit and the love that is poured out of us by God's Spirit. And Jesus is praying that we'd really know this. Secondly, God's love is not transactional. It's not determined by our input or by our output. Without constraint or without consumption, compulsion, he loves us. His love was a priori just as he himself is. He doesn't love us because of anything about us. He loves us because he is love. He doesn't love us because of anything we do. Now, I know you know all this. This is simple stuff, and yet it's the most profound stuff. This is Janet and John book one, but it's also the summa theology. God is love, and God loves us. 
and in this COVID lockdown, we need to hold on to these things that are the foundation of our faith. There is a God. He is Trinitarian. He's marked by love, and he loves us and invites us into that. I'm a great fan of Karl Barth's theology. With my postgrad research on him. And Karl Barth speaks about the God who loves us in freedom, without constraint. Uh, he's not compelled to do it by anything other than the fact he loves us. The wonderful, slightly miserable actually, uh, Danish philosopher and theologian Kierkegaard said, God loved us first. He said, if I wake at dawn and turn to you, you are already there. Your love got there first. God's love beat us to it. He doesn't love us because we love him. He doesn't love us because we do something for him. He loves us because he loves us and always has from all eternity. And he loves us regardless of anything we've done. He loves us before we do anything. We can't merit his love and we can't unmerit it. He loves us and he loved you when you were in a far off country as a prodigal son or daughter. He saw you from afar and he loved you. Verse 24, Jesus says, you loved me before the foundation of the world, billions of years ago. And we're in love with the same love before the foundation of the world. I like what the medieval mystic Meister Eckhart says, however devoted you are to God, you can be sure he is immeasurably more devoted to you. Amazing. And then thirdly, God's love is demonstrable. It's there for all to see. It's not just a feeling. Feelings can come and go, even though the Lord prays we will feel that. But it's objective in time and space. It's historical. In 30 AD, we see love hanging from a tree. Geographical, outside Jerusalem's walls at Golgotha. It's sacrificial. The father suffering the death of his son and the son suffering the death for us. When Jesus died at Calvary, the justice of God is satisfied and the demonic is disarmed and our debt is cancelled and forgiveness is purchased and our uh, righteousness is imputed to us and adoption as sons is conferred upon us and eternal life is secured. What an amazing thing he loves us. What amazing things his love achieves. The writer to the Hebrew says, his blood speaks a better word. It speaks the word that we are loved. Lately, I've been reading Tom Torrance, one of the great 20th century Scottish theologians. And he has this line that I've been thinking about for two weeks. He says, God loves us more than he loves himself. God loves us more than he loves himself. I don't know. I've been thinking around that from every angle. But God suffers the agony of Calvary so we don't have to spend an eternity in agony separated from. Now, many of us, even ministers, even missionaries, even people who've been Christians for decades, even people who've taught this stuff for decades, we can struggle at times to believe that God loves us, let alone that he loves us as much as he loves himself or his son. And that's because actually we don't understand God. Actually, unbelief often takes hold of us. We struggle to understand unconditional love. Our whole uh, matrix of nurture can predicate us against that. And our lives are often lived on the basis of that you get out what you put in but not with God. You are loved by God and you're not his second choice. You're not the substitute on the bench. You're not a booby prize. You are the pearl of great price and the apple of his eye. How about that? Years ago, I spoke to a chap who was exploring the call to ministry and um, he 
came to see me having just been on holiday and uh, told me a story. He'd had a tough upbringing. He'd left school without qualifications. He fell into drugs and violence and crime and dealing and ended up in jail. But God rescued him and God saved him. And uh, he married someone in our church. And here he was uh, wanting to consider ministry. And I was asking him about when that call came. And he told me that he'd been on holiday in France and they had rented a very large Jeep for a few of their families. And he was sharing one afternoon with two friends how he felt distanced from God and that life's experience had somehow made it difficult for him to feel that God loved him. And he said that he told me that he told them, I just want the key. I just want want the key what's the key to it all he said later that evening they all as a family attended some christian meeting in an old restored restored barn and he said as he was on his knees praying asking god what is the key what is the key someone who he didn't know got up and walked across to this old barn door and took out a large wrought iron key and walked over to him. And as he was there on his knees, they put the key on the top of his shoulders, on his neck, and spoke these words in English over him. This is the key, this is the key, that you are God's son and he loves you. And the guy was filled with the spirit and the key opened his heart to God and God to him came to see me and said he wanted to be a minister. And he explored that. But that is the key. Nothing can end his love for us. Nothing can separate us from his love. There's a lot of fear at the moment. We were just hearing about that. In this COVID-19 crisis, anxiety, fear, sickness, fear of death, death itself, that nothing can separate us from God's love. As Solomon said, many waters cannot quench love, not the waters of death. That couldn't separate the father from the son who was raised to life. And even if we die, love will raise us to life. In Romans 8, Paul is celebrating God's love. And he gives a whole catalog of exigencies that might seek or seem to divide us from God and from God's love. And he says, can trouble? No. Distress? No. Persecution? No. Famine? No. Nakedness? No. Danger? No. The sword? No. Death? No. Life? No. Angels? No. Demons? No. Anything? It present? No. Anything in the past? No. Powers? No. Heights? No. Depths? No. Nothing. Absolutely nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God's love never fails. It never has and it never will. Everything and almost everyone in life will fail. A minute ago my laptop crashed. I hope you can hear me as I'm speaking now and I, it hasn't frozen. The politicians, they will fail us. The church, friends, the car, washing machine, fridge freezer, eyesight, hearing, health, Everything fails. Everything has a sort of obsolescence in it, but not God and not God's love. Some of you may have been wishing that your speaker this week would offer some title the Odyssey addressing the COVID crisis or some new ecclesiological model that we need to cultivate as a result. Well, I'm not that smart, but my only theodicy is God is love, and love wins the day. And my ecclesiology is this, that we are the community of those who are loved by the Father and who live in and live out that love. I studied, as I said, Karl Barth in my research, and he was the greatest uh, theologian since the Reformation, in my view published over a hundred books and articles, a lot of repetition. And uh, his influence was felt in the church after his first book and ever since 
1919. That's a hundred years we're still reading him and studying him. On retiring in 1962, he took a lecture tour of America and was speaking in Rockefeller Chapel or, uh, on the campus of Chicago University. And during a Q&A, he was asked a question, Professor Bart, you've written more deeply than any you know, living theologian and most dead ones, and you've written so much, what is the most profound thought you've ever had? Can you sum up your life's work? And his answer was this, yes, I can. In the words of a song, I learned at my mother's knee, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Well, many of you will have heard that story. You will have used that illustration. I often wondered if it was true. And one of the problems was that that story occurs in lots of different places. Throughout that tour of America, this, that quote is placed on his lips in different contexts. And it was, it's been suggested it was just made up. It was a religious urban myth. Well, a couple of years ago, someone did some serious research and they went to a number of the places where Bart visited and a number of the contexts where he spoke. And they, they spoke to a number of the people who were there. And it was proved that he said it in all these different places. Here in retirement, having written all this material, wherever he went, he was telling people, with or without being asked a question, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. He loves us. The Father loves us. The Spirit loves us. And I pray that in this COVID time, more than anything else, you will experience and then be able to, to express this love. Shall we pray? Father, thank you that you saw us from afar and you loved us. And we pray, Father, that by your spirit, this prayer of your son Jesus will be answered in a very powerful and tangible way that the love with which you, Father, love Jesus will be in us, felt, and will overflow from us and be seen. And we thank you, Lord, for loving us. Amen. Well, thank you. And uh, a hand back now to Adrienne, I think. Yeah, thank you, Simon. Thank you so much for um, reminding us of that... Uh, sure and certain love of the father um, that is uh, unconditional that's not restricted and so many other words you use and i think it's good if we take a few moments now to um, with this fresh in our mind to um to, to contemplate these uh, these things that you've been saying so i would like to give you a few moments now to uh, to think about what we've just heard <laughs> 